Okay. Uh, well, it's great to be here. Thanks for uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I'll talk about the Casper experiment, um, and in light of the last couple of talks, I'm going to skip very very briefly over motivation for dark matter. Um, Doug spoke very eloquently about that. So uh, basically, there's a number of pieces of evidence that all point to uh, about 0.3, maybe 0.4 GeV per cubic centimeter uh, energy density that, that kind of sits in dark matter. Uh, and there's uh, a number of candidates for what dark matter could be. Uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of possibilities. And of course, the first one is WIMP, a weakly interactive massive particle with kind of a few neutrons, uh, uh, maybe 100 GeV mass. That's kind of, you know, maybe 100 neutrons or so. Uh, another candidate is the axion, um, much lighter. And so I'm kind of representing it as a, as a field rather than a particle. And of course, uh, uh, after the LIGO detection, there's, there's, uh, there's been some talk about the possibility that dark matter is actually uh, uh, resides in kind of some, some massive black holes, which I will not talk about at all. But I wanted to, I need to put in LIGO in my talk, so I have to have that there. Uh, so first I'm going to have a couple of slides on WIMPs. Um, basically, um, again, very quickly, there's, uh, the WIMPs have been uh, a very well-motivated candidate for a number of decades, and uh, there's the WIMP miracle, uh, uh, which kind of gives roughly the correct abundance at present time. It also has the right properties to be the lightest supersymmetric particle. Uh, however, a number of direct and indirect searches uh, in the last few decades have basically turned up nothing. And uh, a direct, uh, so indirect detection basically kind of looks for um, signals that come from uh, um, astrophysical observations uh, that may indicate the presence and maybe some interactions of these WIMPs. And direct detection experiments to date have basically can be summarized uh, by this figure over here, which is uh, the schematic. You get a big uh, uh, detector, as, as many atoms as possible, basically a big tank of liquid xenon, for example. And you point a bunch of PMTs on this liquid xenon, uh, and you wait. You sit there and wait. And after a while, you're hoping for a WIMP to come in to scatter off of one of the nuclei in the detector and to make some scintillation light, maybe make uh, some electrons uh, uh, that you then detect. And as I said, kind of uh, after several decades uh, and many exclusion plots, um, I should add, actually, Panda X is, is now basically on top of Lux as of a few days ago. Uh, so there's basically, these experiments have, t have essentially turned up nothing with the uh, possible exception of, of, of Dama, uh, but you know, it's unclear what's going on there. And of course, there's the, the famous neutrino floor uh, down at the bottom, which basically says that you know, if you have such a detector and you wait for flashes of light, uh, at some point you're so sensitive that you're going to start detecting neutrinos that come from the sun, that comes from, come from the atmosphere, and so on. At that point, you can't tell the difference. Is that flash a WIMP or a neutrino? I don't know. Uh, so at this, uh, the experiments are getting so sensitive that they're, they're going to get to it uh, kind of in the next or maybe the, after, the generation after next. So I'm going to give a quick plug uh, for some work that we're doing in collaboration with Sujit Rajendran, Ron, and Misha. Uh, and that's an idea for a directional detector, which is kind of trying to get around this problem of the neutrino floor. So the idea is that if you have a detector that can tell which way the WIMP or this, this kind of inc incoming particle came from, then you can just say, well, I'm not going to look at the sun. I'm going to just forget about all of those events and I'm going to look at uh, everything else. Or maybe, as Andre talked about, maybe I'm going to, I'm going to kind of try and figure out how our motion uh, uh, through the galaxy kind of affects the event rate and the kind of... The, I, I have basically, the, the idea is to have some sensitivity to the directionality. Uh, and uh, basically, this is obviously based on diamond, uh, because what else? Uh, so you have, uh, you have a wimp, uh, and uh, you know, this scatters, and, and there's, 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 uh, the wimp kind of happily goes through, and there's a recoil nucleus, and, uh, and, uh, and this recoil nucleus, basically, uh, the recoil energy is kind of a few tens of kil kilovolts, kiloelectron volts. Uh, so what that does is that continues to move through the diamond, and it, makes, it knocks out a bunch of other nuclei. It makes a bunch of vacancies. Uh, it basically damages uh, the diamond. So this is a very similar idea to the cloud chamber, um, except with diamond. 
Uh, so here is, for example, a simulation of such a vacancy track that's produced by about a 10 kilovolt carbon nucleus that, that, that kind of just kind of started to, to move through the diamond. Uh, and then, uh, so this diamond section, uh, this diamond is sectioned, uh, and then there's a PMT that kind of detects which section the event, the scattering event occurs. Uh, and then we pull out that section, we, we look at it under a microscope, uh, and we use the NV centers inside this diamond to basically map the direction of that track. Uh, and, and to kind of, to then back out the, the, the direction of the incoming limp momentum. Um, and, you know, this, well, what, uh, the, the sensitivity uh, looks very reasonable, so what we're working on right now is kind of doing Monte Carlo simulations for what, how this might actually work. Uh, the one thing I should mention that my favorite thing about this particular proposal is that, of course, to be competitive with, uh, uh, with kind of the, the, the state of the art, this has to be a three-ton diamond, you know, meter by meter by meter. And this is music to the ears of, of Element 6, I'm sure, uh, once they find out about this, uh, which is the company that kind of produces these things. Uh, and I'm sure there's lots of graduate students who are just dying to, to work on this experiment. Uh, but anyway, three-ton diamond, no problem. So if you have one, let me know. Uh, we're going to use it to detect dark matter. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on this middle um, dark matter candidate, uh, which is the axion. And again, a couple of the, a few of the previous speakers have talked about the axion, so very, very quick introduction. This is my version of the axion slide. Uh, so it's a pseudoscalar light field. This was proposed uh, in, the, in the 70s to solve the strong CP problem of, of quantum chromodynamics. Uh, and these kinds of particles arise very, very naturally in string theories uh, um, and other kind of theories beyond the standard model. Uh, and so there are three possible, uh, the kind of symmetry basically dictates that there are three possible couplings to, to standard model particles. And the first one um, is, is this coupling to photons, uh, which is the Primakov effect. So here A is this axion field uh, amplitude that Andre talked about, um, uh, and F mu nu, F mu nu is just the electromagnetic field. And this, this coupling is basically the basis, has been the basis for most of the searches for axions to date, such as ADMX, uh, CAST, and so on. Uh, and so here's a little parameter plot. Um, this is uh, in slightly different units uh, from, uh, well, very different units, I think, from what Andy uh, showed. But basically, in these plots that I'm going to show, you have the mass of the axion on the x-axis. This is uh, logarithmic in units of electron volts. And the coupling strength, so basically the prefactor of this term, on the y-axis in, in some units of, some, some natural units, inverse giga electron volts. Uh, and the QCD, the so-called QCD axion, is this band over here. And basically, everything, uh, everything here is excluded by various experiments. And the ADMX, uh, kind of in, a, in, a, in, in some frequency band, goes down all the way down to the, to the QCD axion. Uh, and, and so that's the kind of the, that, that's the state of the field as of a, few, a couple of years ago. Uh, so I'm not going to focus on this coupling. I'm going to talk about two other uh, couplings. And the first one is a coupling to gluons. And this is actually why the axions were invented. This is this point number two. This, is, this coupling solves the strong CP problem of QCD. So this is in some sense generic. Um, and uh, um, basically, if I write this down, uh, uh, this G is the gluon field. If I write down the non-relativistic version of the Hamiltonian, it looks like this. Uh, so it's basically couples to spin sigma. That's the Hamilton, that's the coupling Hamiltonian. And I will talk about what E star is in a minute. Uh, and there's a third coupling that's also allowed by symmetry for an axion. This is coupling to fermions, and this is known as axion wind. Uh, so the Hamiltonian would look like, again, there's a spin sigma, and now you coupling, uh, uh, this coupling describes uh, a gradient of the axion field. So this is a gradient of A. Um, so basically, um, what uh, Casper cosmic axion spin precession experiments, and there's a couple of them, and the idea is to search for these couple, for, for signatures of these couplings, uh, where A is axion field due to the dark matter. Uh, so basically, we're going to take a bunch of spins, and we're going to see what happens if, if axions exist, and if axions are the main component of dark matter, then there should be some signatures, some experimentally measurable signatures of these couplings. And that's what we're searching for. 
All right, so let me take the first coupling, this, this one over here, and let me rewrite it um, up here at the top. Uh, this is, A is, again, this axion or axion-like particle field. Uh, sigma is a spin, so I have a single spin for now. Uh, and E star is some kind of an effective electric field that I'm going to sweep under the rug. Andre already uh, described. Um, uh, so, so basically, the, this mechanism that if, if, uh, if the axion constitutes the main component or the major component of the dark matter energy density, and the mass range of the axion uh, is roughly a microelectron volt, uh, then basically the, this dark matter uh, field acts as a classical field, uh, and it oscillates at the axion Compton frequency, omega A, which is just mc squared over h bar. Uh, just because it's a classical field, so it's got to do that uh, to zeroth order. Uh, so, okay, so this is my classical field, and A0, of course, is the amplitude of this field, and the uh, the, the larger that is, the larger the energy density in the field. So I can basically back out from this 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter. I can back out what I expect A0 to be. Um, so I'm going to plug this up here, and I'm going to basically say, okay, and now I'm going to actually write down the coupling constant, which, I, which I'm leaving out here. Uh, and so this is what the Hamiltonian looks like. And I'm going to rewrite that. I'm going to say it's basically sigma dot something, um, and I'm going to call that something B1 star. So it's a, uh, uh, Andy already mentioned, it's kind of like an effective magnetic field. It's not a real magnetic field. It's not electromagnetism. But it couples to a spin just like a magnetic field would. So the Hamiltonian, all this complicated stuff, basically is sigma dot B in the end. So to, I'm an experimentalist. I really don't care about all the gluons and stuff like that. I care about sigma dot B. And this B oscillates at the frequency which is equal to the Compton frequency of the axion, uh, just this mass times c squared over h bar. Um, so that's it. So basically, this is my uh, effective interaction. And uh, the idea is to search for this effective interaction using magnetic resonance. So here's the, here's the gist of the idea. I have a spin. Uh, actually, uh, um, uh, well, this is, this is maybe three spins. Uh, and it's a spin a half. And it's in some external magnetic field, B0. So the spin states are split, spin down and spin up. And they're split by some splitting G mu B, 0. Uh, so the first thing I do is I have a sample with such spins, and I polarize these guys. So I do something, maybe I cool it down, or, or do some optical pumping, or something like that. And I imagine that all of these spins are in the spin down state, the ground state. Uh, so, in other words, the, the sample is magnetized along this magnetic field. That's the first thing I do. Uh, and then, imagine I get really lucky so that this spin, sp spin splitting exactly matches this uh, uh, omega A, h bar omega A, the, the Compton frequency of the axion. If there's a match, then you can see what this, with this Hamiltonian, basically this, this interaction can now, spin, can now flip the, these spins. Right? Because if I have magnetic resonance, basically, if, this, if the frequency of this field matches the spin splitting, then I can start to flip spins. And what this looks like to the sample over here is basically the magnetization starts to uh, tilt. So this is exactly like magnetic resonance, except in magnetic resonance, this is a real magnetic field that, that I apply with an RF coil. Here, instead of a real magnetic field, we have axion dark matter that makes a pseudo-magnetic, an effective magnetic field. Uh, so uh, to detect this effect, of course, we place a magnetometer next to our sample, uh, which, which, for example, through Faraday effect, uh, or maybe it's a squid, detects this processing magnetization, because the magnetization processes in the applied magnetic field. Uh, so that's the idea. The idea is to basically sweep uh, B0, and when we hit resonance, then we'll see a signal in our magnetometer. So it's just an NMR experiment. Very simple idea. Uh, right, so uh, this is a lab scale search. This is a picture of our lab uh, about six months, six, seven months ago. And this is a, a month or two ago. Uh, so basically, this is the, gives you the general idea of kind of how large this experiment is. Um, here is my sample with, with the magnetometer. And everything will sit 
in a cryostat, uh, and Denise is the graduate student who's working on this experiment over here, and she's cooling down this cryostat, filling it with liquid helium. Uh, uh, so this, is, this gives you the, the, the kind of scale of this experiment. It's a laboratory scale experiment. Um, so uh, let me give you a couple of details about uh, what we're doing. Uh, the first... Um, the first thing, the first uh, thing that I'm going to cover is this sample over here that I said nothing at all about so far except to say that it's full of spins. Um, here is my interaction. Uh, basically, I have to choose. I can, I can do whatever I want. I can pick whatever sample I want, of course. Uh, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to maximize this B1 star. So I'd like to measure a big signal rather than a small signal. Um, and I want to... I want to be sensitive. In other words, I want to maximize the spin density and optimize the spin coherence time. So what we're doing is we're using a ferroelectric solid uh, where nuclear spins can kind of see these effective electric fields, E star, on the order of 10 to the 8 volts per centimeter. And this is, of course, exactly the same physics as John Doyle uh, talked about yesterday uh, and is used in the ACME EDM experiment. Uh, or maybe not exactly the same, but very similar because we have a nuclear spin. But basically, the idea is that you have a solid. Here is a little crystal structure of a solid, and there's a little red atom over here. And in a ferroelectric, the equilibrium position of this atom is off-center in the unit cell. Um, so a unit cell has some kind of a dipole moment, and this looks just like a diatomic molecule, essentially, effectively, um, except in a solid. So, uh, the, you know, in, in such a solid, the nuclear spin density is pretty high, 3 times 10 to the 21, and the spin coherence time, uh, the nuclear spin coherence time uh, is, is rather long also. It's, uh, it's, it's typically about a millisecond, um, uh, um, for, for the, at least for the spins that, we're, that we've chosen. And specifically, uh, here's a partial list of the materials that we're working with, uh, and you can see kind of the recurring theme here is the lead. Uh, atoms, specifically the lead 207 isotope, which has a nuclear spin, a half. Uh, and here, these are all ferroelectric, and you can see here a photograph of some samples that were prov provided to us by one of our collaborators. Uh, so this, this thing is basically this sample over here. All right, uh, the magnetometer, uh, this thing over here, uh, can be a couple of things. Uh, the simplest thing to do is just to do a coil, uh, hook it up to an amplifier, and just do inductive Faraday detection, uh, maybe with a tank circuit. Uh, the next simplest thing is, uh, just, like, just as Andy described, is to use a squid, because we're, sitting, we're going to be sitting at 4 Kelvin liquid helium anyway, so we might as well put a squid in there. Here's a picture of a squid, and here's some, uh, uh, some noise spectrum that we've taken. Uh, OK, so several. Speakers have pointed out that this is all very nice and good, but really the devil is in the systematics. Uh, so let me spend one or two slides talking about the systematics, and we've thought a lot about uh, um, the, um, the systematics that we're likely to encounter. Uh, so let me again remind you that basically this is somewhat similar to an EDM experiment, except in an EDM experiment that John talked about yesterday, uh, um, th there's an electric field that gets flipped uh, that basically determines the uh, and and what 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 the exper the gist of the experiment is is to 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 measure the change in the Lamore frequency of the electron, for example, as you flip the electric field. So here, there's no flips of electric field. It's the axion itself that kind of provides an effective electric or magnetic field that flips. So basically, our job is just to sit there and to make sure that things don't change as much as possible at this frequency. So, of course, we put everything in a superconducting magnetic shield because, again, we're at 4 Kelvin, so uh, why not? And that's going to shield out all the, all the kind of, you know, all the perturbations coming from the outside, hopefully. But the main systematic, the, the, the most serious systematic that, that we've kind of analyzed so far is, is just vibration. You can see a sample over here sitting in, in some magnetic field, and as it vibrates, uh, the vibrations might couple uh, into our pickup loop and look just like an axion. Um, what, what, what we think will, what we're pretty sure will save us is the fact that the vibrational frequency is our kind of, kind of kilohertz frequencies, and this is pretty far from the axion frequencies that we're going to search for um, 
at least a kind of at small magnetic fields, the vibration coupling, the vibration systematic should be small, and at larger magnetic fields, we're going to look at larger frequencies anyway. Um, so the other, you know, so there's a number of other systematics that that we will that, that we've analyzed, but basically to protect ourselves from 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 these guys, what we're going to do is we're going to have several samples sitting in there. And we're going to have several pickup loops and several independent measurements. Uh, and again, as Andre pointed out, this, uh, um, this axion, at least in the frequency range that we're interested in, has a pretty large uh, uh, coherence length. So what that means is that all of these samples basically see the same axion field. Uh, so they should respond identically to, uh, or, or you know, nominally identically if they're polarized in the same way, maybe we can polarize these ferroelectrics in different direction and, and, and kind of modulate the effect that way. Um, and of course, uh, if we do have a detection and we, we kind of say, all right, well, we see dark matter, this is axions, you know, we, uh, good for us, uh, then it's, uh, you know, it, it's easy to check in an independent experiment uh, because the axion frequency must be the same. It's a, it's a, the axion mass is presumably, uh, it could of course change in time, uh, but that's presumably a small effect. So, you know, an experiment elsewhere must measure, you know, the same freak, an effect of the same frequency. Uh, so here is the summary of our experimental reach. Uh, basically, once again, what I'm doing is I'm plotting the axion mass on the x-axis and the coupling on the y-axis. Everything above this green band over here has been ruled out by astrophysical observations. Uh, the QCD axion band is, is, is shown over here. And basically, we have two, two kind of planned phases of our experiment. Phase one is to basically just go and, and, uh, uh, and do what we know how to do. Uh, and then phase two is to do some R&D to in, improve the polarization and so on and so forth. Uh, and basically, what you can see is that there's a we can, uh, 20, you know, 10 orders of magnitude, we can cut into the, the parameter space, you know, at least at, at, at these frequencies over here. Uh, so there's a lot of unexplored space. Uh, and and the, uh, I think to me the main selling point of this experiment is that just by changing the current in our coil, we can tune the frequency over here. So there's a very wide dynamic range of masses that we can look at, uh, in. Um, and uh, and we, you know, in a lot of these, we do have the potential to measure all the way down to the QCD axion. So our collaboration is several institutions uh, around the world. Um, and, uh, you know, they're shown by these dots up here. Uh, and basically, the, the, the experimental efforts are concentrated uh, at Boston University, where we're searching, where we're doing this Casper Electric uh, experiment using the spins and solids that I talked about. And there's, there's an experimental effort at Mainz, led by Dima Butker, uh, where um, the search is for the Casper wind coupling, uh, so the gradient coupling, and, and uh, those guys are using liquid xenon. Um, and this is their kind of exclusion parameter plot. And of course, we have invaluable support from uh, uh, the guys on the West Coast in California. Uh, and the next speaker will, uh, uh, is, is shown right here. Uh, so. Um, I want to acknowledge everyone here. Uh, and of course, uh, recruiting graduate students, postdocs. So um, if anyone's interested in this experiment, let me know. Uh, so here is, again, the picture of the experimental setup. Here is our uh, experimental reach. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, oh, so this is not shown, but this is this little blue band over here. So the ADMX, uh, what, what these guys, those guys are doing is they, they have a cavity. And to change the, the, the frequency uh, of the axion that they're sensitive to, they have to tune that cavity. Uh, and basically, that's determined by the size of the cavity modulo some tuning rods that they put in and out. So that's why they don't have, a, well, they have a, a wide frequency range they can, they, can, they can look in. It's a factor of a few. Right? But on this plot, it doesn't show up as very wide because you can see this is many, many orders of magnitude. Uh, 
And uh, whereas, you know, here they're certainly a lot more sensitive than our experiment will ever be, and they're at higher frequencies, uh, but the CASPER, well, number one is we're looking at different coupling. They're looking at couplings to photons. At coupling to photons, we're looking at coupling to gluons. So it's an entirely different, it's complementary couplings. Uh, and number two is this, you know, the kind of the CASPER has a very wide dynamic range because you just got to change the current in the coil. Yeah. Are you concerned at all about Johnson noise for materials inside your computer? So, um, I mean, these materials are all um, uh, insulators. Uh, so basically, um, let's see. So I mean, the the, the uh, you know everything in here. This is kind of the an experimental uh, apparatus. Everything in here is 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 basically either insulating and super or superconducting. Uh, so that's in that way, we're, we're pretty sure that we'll be um, we we shouldn't see too much Johnson noise. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so we're basically we're not using any 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 conductors in there, unless they're superconductors. Uh, yes, so this foil here is uh, so I didn't I didn't talk about these details, but these are superconducting foils. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that's, uh, I'm glad you noticed that. So basically the idea, the idea is, is that, it, so it's not a, if, of course if you make a, a, a ring or, or kind of just, just make a cylinder or something like that and it's superconducting, then you can't change the magnetic field through it, right? Uh, but basically the, well, so the idea is not to close it, but to basically make a foil, uh, kind of a Swiss roll type thing where you have a foil and then you insulate the two sides. So it kind of still acts as a superconductor, but it's not a closed superconductor. So you can still change the flux through it, no problem. That's the design idea. So I, I know you have, and this is perhaps also a question perhaps for both of you. Um, this, this sounds very, I mean, to, to somebody like me who really doesn't understand all that much about, about kind of third facts and that, uh, uh, it sounds very seductive, this, this kind of, um, um, having this kind of pseudo-magnetic field. Um, it also kind of s sounds like this is, there should be about like 50 other possibilities of, of if you measure something of what that could be. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, um, how much are people agreeing that if you would measure something here that this would be really excellent. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's a... I mean, this is probably the same question in both of them. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And I think the main answer I would say is that, well, if we measure something, of course, we're going to check and recheck. And, you know, this is... Yeah, I'm not but, holding your ex <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, the, I mean, the main check, you know, so there's, there's the usual systematic checks and there's, uh, you know, there's all the obvious things that we can do. But even if we, every, even if everything works as it, we think everything works as it should, and even if uh, you know we checked and rechecked everything, and then we say, all right, we see axions, right? Then anyone is free to go and 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 say, all right, well these guys are seeing axions at 38.9 megahertz. You know, so it's at that point you don't have to you don't have to do all of this, yeah, yeah, exactly. right? So you know exactly yeah. where to go. You know, in this parameter space over here, you know, well, presumably there's going to be some strength of the effect. So yeah. what we're saying is there's a point over here at which the axion lives. Yeah. So then you can go build an experiment and either confirm or, uh, um, you know, or, or deny. Not. Yeah, or not confirm the, the whole thing. I just wanted to add to that. So if in our experiment we discover something that you know, we would maybe deconvince we found an axion-like particle, but we probably still want to measure the neutron units to make sure that it, it okay. actually is, is yeah. the heat axion. <laughs> yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so as Andre, well, so I, I think the reason I haven't mentioned that is because, uh, you know, it would be it would be a fantastic luxury to have to build a network, 
you know, if we see something and then, so if someone else builds another experiment, then it becomes a network. And then, of course, we could correlate uh, and we could do all the things that Andre talks about. But I think it's, uh, you know, at this point, we're kind of at this, at this stage over here. So, you know, uh, uh, let's see here. Did I, did, so, so we're not quite there yet. You know, we're, we're kind of, this is far from a network. Uh, not quite. Different couplings, right? So we're looking at different couplings. Remember that that this is Casper Wind. This, well, well, okay. I, or it could be two axions. You know, how, who says it's one axion? But it's we are looking at different. So generically, there's no reason to. At least the theorists tell us that generically, there's no reason to expect one of them to be much greater than the other, or one of them to be zero, the other one not zero. So, so generically, they should both be there. But they are different couplings. So strictly speaking, it's not the same experiment. It's complementary. But it would still be great to correlate the two. It doesn't sound as good, you know. <laughs> I think three ton diamond just sounds good. Yeah. Uh, but also, the, the the thing about NVs is that they're either very well studied, very well characterized. It's it's basically a, you know, I think it would be fair to say that it's a well developed technology now. Uh, whereas, you know, I'm not aware of any other color center that's been studied quite as well to date. And so, which is than and which is cheaper? Well, okay, right. So I would say that's, for me, that's the end. It's just, uh, we know the properties very well. We know how to work with them. It's just a matter of getting a three-ton diamond, and that's it. Well, I, I guess one thing that seems scary about Casper is this ferroelectric solid. It's, I don't know what goes on a ferroelectric solid. I doubt anyone else really does either. Is there any way you can build this on some slightly simpler material? Like, for example, the patch potentials move around inside a ferroelectric solid. I don't know. That sounds terrifying. Like, even a, even a gold surface has patch potentials moving on it. So no, but this is, okay, so this is a good question, and I could turn this around and say, well, does anyone know what's going on inside a diatomic molecule? That hasn't stopped ACME guys from, you know, putting out and saying this effective electric field is 10 to the 8. Uh, so I agree with you that it's, it's strictly speaking at the level of theory, and, you know, this is a magical number that kind of somehow theorists come out uh, with. Now, this is not a real electric field. That's important. A real electric field gets screened, as you point out, with the patch potentials. This is, this is, you know, so I didn't want to get into this, but this is basically, again, ex very, th exactly the same physics that, that's what happens in a diatomic molecule. You, you have a polarization, basically, um, and that's all you need. And then the physics is the same. So, you know, is it, is it set in stone? I, 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 I wouldn't say so. Uh, but I would say it's as well established as the diatomic molecule kind of effective electric fields. So. Right. So, thank you very much. Thank you.